that's me. I'm a gaming guy. Uh, I was fortunate uh, when I was born in 81, when basically this video gaming in its entertainment form started and uh, started to become like a mass market entertainment. And uh, that means that I've played practically every game out there with every device out there, whether it was Nintendos, whether it was Playstations, I played them all. And um, very soon after I had played all those games, I started figuring out how do these, these things work. Like uh, I always had the passion for figuring out how games are made. And because of that, I very early started to break the games. So I would buy the games, I would copy them, download them, whatever it was back in the day, and I would try to figure out how they are made and modify them one way or another. One thing led to another, and that became my hobby, and very soon I realized I was actually making games on my own, building games from scratch. And um, <clears throat> 10 years ago, uh, gaming became my profession, and uh, during those 10 years, I've done more than 25 game launches globally, and uh, we built this awesome company called Nitro Games. And um, let's go forward. So when we talk about games, we're talking about a $100 billion business globally. So that means that we are leaving behind, whether it's movies, whether it's uh, music industry. Gaming is the fastest growing sector in the field of uh, digital entertainment. And uh, mobile gaming, which essentially means that I play with this. Uh, this is the fastest growing sector inside the actual gaming, currently representing roughly 35 billion USD annually. And uh, what I have here is actually a selection of top 10 crossing games on iPhone in US from May 3rd, a couple of days ago. And uh, those numbers that you see over there are their daily revenues. So that's what the best games are making every single day. So in other words, we're creating a game that you play on a mobile phone, and that one single game can be a 1 billion USD business case annually. So that's the ballpark we're talking about when you succeed really well. Um, I'm not really sure that how much you know about gaming in general, so I thought to give you a quick lecture. Um, so when we talk about mobile gaming, we talk about gaming as a service which means that I'm not playing in my living room or I'm not playing sitting next to my PC. I'm playing on the go. So wherever I go, I have this with me and I want to pull it out from my pocket, have a couple of minutes of fun and then continue whatever it was that I was doing. So that's the sort of user case how I use these things. And uh, the gaming is very socially driven. This is the thing for people who are basically my age who have everything else except time. We don't necessarily even have time for hobbies and so on. So games are our social tool. They are our competitive tool that helps us to interact with other humans. That's why we're willing to invest so much into this as consumers. And all these games are essentially free to play, which means that anybody can download our games or the competitor's games for free. That doesn't cost a thing. And we monetize our users through what we call in-app purchases. That means that there's a one player in a group of 100 players that will pay us something. And that something is typically a microtransaction, anything between $1 to $100. And that's how game companies make their money. That's how you end up with those success stories I showed you earlier, where you can make several millions of dollars every day, which obviously means that you need a huge pool of players. And therefore, all the gaming nowadays is cloud connected that it's very analytics driven. That means that whenever me or anybody else is playing any of our games, they're all the time connected to the cloud globally, whether they are here in Sweden or in China or in US or even in Finland. That means that it's a big, big, big uh, pile of data that these game companies have. And based on that data, they crunch and come to conclusions how to improve the service called game. So it's not exactly a hit-driven, pure luck, coin flip type of approach, but it's more about analyzing the data and making conclusions based on that and improving the service based on that. So, we have a $100 billion business. There's countless game companies out there. And uh, what's funny, in my opinion, is that everybody here shares the same problem, whether it's an investor, whether it's a game company, whether it's any other party who's interested in gaming. And that question is that how to pick the winners. These devices 
I mean the hardware is developing with an accelerating pace at all times and it's pretty safe to say that this is the new Xbox or the new PlayStation. There's so much power in this device. That means that the consumers are demanding more and more also from the game software, which means that it's getting more and more expensive to develop even a mobile game. I think the highest price that I've heard for a mobile game development just to develop the software was 25 million USD. Typically you spend something like 12 to 18 months and half a million to 2 million US dollars. That's the pretty normal ballpark nowadays. And then on the other hand, you also need to make sure that you get that huge pool of downloads. And that, my friends, costs money because you need to pay for every single download unless you have a hugely viral or organic game. That means that you have two costs that are increasing all the time. One is the development of these games and one is the marketing. And the problem everybody has that while the sort of stakes are getting higher, the price of market entry is getting higher. How do I know which game or which company to invest into? And we have a solution. So, Nitro Games is a 10 years old game company. Uh, we were founded in 2007. Uh, we've done more than 20 game launches globally. We've worked mostly on our own IP. We've also worked with some of the industry leading companies with their IP. So when it comes to gaming, we've seen it all. We've done it all. And uh, these first years uh, in Nitro Games, we used to work with game publishers, which means that we essentially developed the game software and then we licensed that to a publisher. For example, East India company that you can see over there was licensed to a Stockholm-based publisher called Paradox Interactive. This model, however, uh, is designed to serve the interest of the publisher, which means that regardless of how good or bad our games were, how much or less money they made, that money went into the pockets of the publisher, not too much into our pockets. So, a couple of years ago, in 2013, we decided to make a big transition in Nitro Games and we decided that we want to take control over our revenues. So we figured that we want to focus on mobile gaming because that's the fastest growing sector and that's ideal for a small and agile team like us for 25 people in two studios in Finland. And on mobile, uh, we first started by rolling out our first game launches together with game publishers to get our name out there to make Nitro Games known in the field of mobile gaming. And right now we're moving into self-publishing, which means that we're controlling the whole cycle between creating the game and getting it to the customer. And uh, I mentioned to you about the problem of how to pick the winners in this industry. And uh, there's a couple of things uh, how we have now tackled that problem. One is you need to have a market trend. Uh, you can enter a market that's already big or that's already established, but you need to find something there that sort of justifies for you to actually exist. And uh, what we have identified is this trend called real-time multiplayer. That in a simple form means that I start playing right now and somewhere in here or in China or in US or wherever, there's somebody playing against me right now. That is now possible on mobile devices due to the latest developments on the technological side Previously, mobile games have been played in this non-real-time fashion where I play something now and whoever I played against with responds, let's say, this evening. So right now we can play real-time and that's a trend that we have identified and that's a trend that Nitro Games is tapping into. And uh, this is super important because whenever there's a new trend, it means that on the market there's room for new players, new companies to come over and take over their market share. These other type of genres are already pretty much saturated, which means it's super expensive to do marketing in those genres. It's super difficult to try to get your game out there because it's full of games already in that genre. So you need to identify a new slot that's only just now opening up. So that's what we've done. And then you need to make sure that you are able to deliver. Uh, we're not saying that we are the only company who have seen this magical new market trend appearing. Everybody knows that it's going to come. Everybody knows that it's going to be a big thing. But we feel we have something really unique in Nitro Games, thanks to our 10 years of history, that we can do this better than competition. And that is these three things. We have one of the oldest and most experienced teams in Finland, one of the oldest and most experienced teams in the whole wide world when it comes to mobile gaming. We've done more games than, than most of our competition out there. 
We have spent last four years developing our own proprietary technology, which we call Nitro Games Platform. I could talk ages about that, but to put it in a simple form, it means that we have global cloud coverage and we can make the game software faster than competition. And then we are utilizing our experienced team and the technology that we have developed with a unique new process, which we call Nitro Games MVP process. That essentially means that we are publishing our games first time for end consumers after one week of development. So the problem is that since these are services, how do I know whether my service is good or bad? Typically companies spend up to one year of developing something in the dark in their studio and then they do something called test launch. We cut down that one year into one week with the help of our technology and our process. And then we keep launching updates on a weekly or bi-weekly basis and constantly all the time measuring, which means that we're able to minimize the amount of time and money spent on something that simply doesn't work. Because we're going to make game software that doesn't work. Everybody is doing failures, but you just want to minimize the time and money spent on making those failures so that you can actually spend the time and money on something that is proven to work and bet on those games harder. And uh, with this in general, we feel we're able to cut down the time to market compared to competition. We're able to have more attempts compared to competition when hitting for this market trend. And also, since games are a hit-driven business, we feel the best way to tackle that both in good and bad is to have a portfolio. So we're not talking about creating one game and then working on that. We're talking about creating a portfolio of these games with this method. And uh, that means that you're able to also minimize the risk, but also maximize the potential because you can take benefit from cross sales between one product to another. You can direct your users from one game to another. And that gives you true scalability on mobile. Um, here's how we see the uh, gaming industry uh, and uh, our place in that. Basically, you can split things uh, in an easy way like this, so that on the top layer you have PC and console games or game companies, which means typically that you still buy games in a box from your game store or from your hard local grocery store or wherever you buy them, or you download them digitally. But these are the typical sort of video games that people very often refer to, whether it's Xbox or whatever. And on the bottom layer, you have mobile and web, which means that it's something designed for people on the go and something that's 100% digital. That's the key here. There is no need to warehouse anything, no need to manufacture anything. Everything from the game software to the end consumer experience is completely digital. And uh, then on left and right, I have casual games and hardcore games. Casual games means games that my mom plays, basically. It means games that I play as well. It please, means games that my kids play. So think of something that G5 Games or King does, like we all love Candy Crush. My mom loves it, I love it, my kids love it, everybody loves it. So that means that it's super wide audience typically, which means that from our point of view, it's also impossible to do any targeted marketing because I can't describe you or you in the same way, you are two different people. So when we're talking about mobile game marketing, I need to be able to figure out the core customer and target my marketing activities for that core customer. So therefore, we are in the very lower right corner. And that means that we are basically doing on mobile what Paradox, which I hope some of you know, uh, is doing on PC. So focusing on a very small niche, but because the industry is so big, uh, the small isn't really an adequate word here. But focusing on a very selected niche, which is in, in our books mid-core gaming on mobile. That means that we know exactly who our customer is, where he is, and how we can target and find those customers. And that gives you a quick, sorry, big benefit when it comes to publishing these games because you don't need to worry about reaching everybody out there. You only need to find that selected group of people. And that's both cheaper and quicker. Basically, our business model is pretty straightforward. Uh, in the first part in the left, uh, we developed the game software and the game IP. And uh, that we do in-house. With our technology, we're able to keep the team size relatively small. So we only have the super talented people in amongst those 25. Then when it comes time to do mass production, like say I have a mobile game with 100 different characters, I need 100 different 3D models. Our artists 
do the first, let's say, 10, maybe 20 key characters and models, and then we outsource the mass production. That helps us to cut down on the schedule and cost. And uh, after that, uh, we publish our portfolio, which is basically a case of doing PR and marketing. When it comes to mobile games, PR is not that important because that's not how people discover games on mobile. And marketing is actually pretty straightforward. You don't need to worry about TV or, or print magazines or anything unless you're in the scale of king. Uh, at that point, you need to start worrying about things like that. But to get to that scale, you don't need to worry about anything else than digital marketing on mobile phones. And basically, you can get really, really far simply by using Facebook advertising. And now we get back to the previous slide where I told you that we have a really defined customer base since we're focusing on this very defined genre. That means that Facebook suddenly becomes our best friend because they know all about you, whether you wanted it or not, if you have joined that service. Which means that we can target our marketing globally really effectively and we can do it all from Finland. We don't need to go anywhere from our office and we reach the global audience easily. The game software gets distributed through Apple App Store and Google Play. Similar stores, the only difference is that if I have an iPhone, I go to Apple App Store. If I have an Android phone, I go to Google Play. They take 30% and that's it. Publishing technically there is super easy and straightforward. There is no big wonders on that. One thing though you need to make sure is that you keep the platform holders happy. We have learned that Apple loves games that make their devices look good because they want to sell me a new iPhone every Christmas. And I want to make them games that give me a good reason to get a new iPhone every Christmas. I believe that's one of the reasons why Apple has featured every single game and every single update we've ever done on this device, which means free visibility in their store, and that's worth of millions of dollars. Then, after all that hard work, you actually have those users that you want. Now starts the difficult thing, and this is something that uh, very often game companies forget. That is engagement. It's games as a service. You need to put effort into servicing your customers. You need to deliver updates to them. You need to keep them entertained. You need to have people that are replying back to their hopes and wishes. You need to have them involved. And that's a critical key thing that you need to remember if you want to do free to play on mobile. And that's unfortunately something where several companies very often fail. With our previous launch, a game called Rage of Glory, we got recognition for this specific part from uh, uh, game Connection Awards in Paris in, in 2016 when we won the best social game award globally for that game. So that's something we know really well. Our first self-published game, uh, this is coming out uh, this summer, so nicely in connection with the IPO that uh, we're also promoting here. Uh, Medals of War is a mobile game that's competitive, real-time multiplayer for mid-core audience designed for uh, basically Western cultures. So talking Western Europe and US here. Uh, you can learn all about the game and have a go at our booth 25 meters that way. This is our team. So it's luckily not just me. Uh, I have my awesome co-founder Antti Villanen, who's also our executive chairman. Uh, if I'm the games guy, he's the marketing guy. He's been doing marketing his whole age and gotten tons of awards for doing so. Then we have Mr. Matti Nikola, he's our CFO. He also is familiar with working, uh, he used to work with Swedish companies in the past, so he's familiar with crunching the numbers in style. Uh, then we have Mr. Mikko Kahra, our CMO. He's in charge of making sure that we know what we're doing when it comes to acquiring the customers. So he's leading those activities. And then Samparanka, our CTO, he's the technical mastermind behind our, our technology. Nitro Games platform that we've been developing for the last four years is now, I believe, third game engine that he's been programming. So he, he knows his ways around those. And uh, here's our key financials. And uh, what, what we can see from here is that when we started this new strategy in 2013, uh, we started basically again, back again from zero started rebuilding the company from ground up. Uh, now we have been generating uh, revenues, but what I want to point out here is that despite that uh, we have 100% year-on-year growth rate on the revenues so far, uh, this is all without doing a single game with this new self-published business model. So why we're doing the IPO right now is we're looking for funds to self-publish our games, and that helps us to uh, further increase the revenues moving forward. 
Uh, about the IPO, so so we're looking to do do the uh, subscription period between May 10 and May 23, so very soon, in other words, and uh, we're looking to raise 3.2 million euros in in total from the IPO. So so that's uh, 30 million sec roughly, and uh, basically the subscription price is roughly 40 sec per share. And uh, the funds from the IPO, uh, how we plan to use them, uh, repayment of loan means some of the bridge funding that we have taken to uh, make the IPO possible, we want to pay those back. But most of it is going into working capital and marketing, which means essentially producing the remaining games in our portfolio and marketing those foreign customers, getting the initial marketing data out from there. And after that, uh, it's all about recycling the revenues that we get from the games and in reinvesting those into new titles. So, I mentioned in the beginning that it's a $100 billion business and the problem everybody has is that how to pick the winners. Uh, that's our recipe, so threefold. You need to make sure that you know exactly where you're going on the market and why you want to go there. You need to see something that's already big but expanding so that there's room for new companies and new products out there in that market segment. You need to make sure that you have done your homework. You need to make sure that you have some USBs why you're better than all the other ones out there. Something you are doing differently, more cleverly, so that you don't get squashed by the competition while you're trying. And then third, I think this applies to any business out there. Uh, if it's sort of hit-driven entertainment business, you need to think strategically and you need to have a portfolio. Having a one-shot is never going to be enough. It might work. Sometimes somebody did Flappy Bird but that's one in a billion, so you need to have a portfolio. Excellent. So thank you for listening. So that was our talk part. Jussi, please sit down. Excellent. Welcome to Sweden. Thank you. <laughs> so first I wanted to know, uh, who in the audience has investment in a gaming company today? Vem har idag investeringar i den här formen av spelföretag? They are kanske... Lucky few. Ah, lucky few, you say. Okay, how do you feel about these numbers? Um, I think more of you probably should consider doing that. Ask those who have done it and you probably have good experiences. And Inoida, are you happy? Very convinced, yes, over there at least. Okay, so you say that you offer an interesting opportunity for investors since the marketplace lacks a company like Nitro Games. So what is it that you bring that we don't already have? Yeah, so uh, Sweden is a little bit different uh, when it comes to Finland in the sort of offering of companies. Uh, Sweden was very strong and still is on these so-called traditional platforms. So on PC and console, you have you have Paradox Interactive, for example, the tip of the iceberg representing that, that sector. However, uh, where I think Finland has outperformed Sweden uh, during the last few years is in the field of mobile gaming especially if we're talking about social mobile gaming. You have some super good companies here like King, uh, but then again, they are not available on the marketplace where we are addressing. So we, but we is this also in the stock market that you're unique somehow yeah. for investors? Yeah, yeah. so, so we, we looked at different, different markets out there when we ended up selecting Nasdaq First, not Stockholm, and we saw that there's clearly a hole for a company like us to fill. And uh, we also, also felt that uh, we are interesting for the investors in that sector. Yeah, you're saying that you're already noticing an interest. In what way? Uh, well, basically, we again did our homework. So it's not the first time I'm in Sweden. And uh, we, we talked with quite a few investors, mostly from Stockholm, to try to see that uh, sort of like measuring the amount of interest before making the final decision. And what was the response? Well, obviously, very positive since I'm here. So. Good for you. Yeah. So there, you're, you're saying very strongly several times that there needs to be a space for you in the market. There is a very defined window of opportunity. Um, so so um, what, is, what is your... Um, let's see. Yeah, so, so how strong do you feel is this window right now? Uh, if we talk about the um, gaming market, uh, I, I feel that... Uh, window of opportunity is definitely very strong since uh, we, we know that there's quite a lot of companies who are trying to address the same, same, same market segment. 
But that said, uh, we have seen from the different sort of trends and different cycles in the gaming industry that uh, uh, the window of opportunity is open for quite some time. But typically, typically those who succeed first are able to get sort of a market position and, mm. and hold that. That's for how, for example, King was formed back in the day. Mm. That's why it's so impossible for anybody to try to it's challenge them in their own. It's a critical phase. Yeah. And uh, you showed us very clearly on the, the map here, you saw where you are when it comes to what kind of games you make. But what is your position? How strong are you in the gaming market? Uh, basically, uh, we feel that we are really strong when it comes to this mid-core audience, which essentially is uh, well, guys like me who are in their plus 30s. They, they might have uh, at least average income. Uh, they have everything else except time. And uh, amongst that type of customer who play games as a hobby, we are really well known thanks to our 10 years of history. They have played our games on PC when they were young, when I was still young as well. And now when they've grown up, they might have kids and stuff, so they no longer have the time to play on PC. So we I've are heard there to that. bring them the experience of mobile. <laughs> yeah. And you said that it takes uh, about 1-2% paying customers uh, since you have this free-to-play uh, business model. Yeah. So are you there? Do you have the rates of paying customers that you need? Uh, actually, the 1% was more like a sort of industry average or mm -hmm. industry standard. Uh, the best that we've been able to do is a little bit less than 3%. So we're definitely there. Are you happy there. with these numbers? Uh, very. Very, okay. Uh, any questions from the audience? You can say them in Swedish or English. What do people buy for this 1%? What are they paying for? Okay, so that's actually pretty straightforward. What they buy is time. So the people who are buying are people like me. Uh, they're playing against, say, teenagers or people who are 20 or something. So what I don't have is time. So what I'm buying in these mobile games is tools for me to speed up the progress so that I don't need to invest a lot of time. I want to be able to compete with those teenagers who spent all their days and nights playing those games. But I can't invest that much of, of time. However, it's not a problem for me to use my credit card to buy that time. Now we have... So faster progression. Yeah. What so happens when you buy time? We have very short time left, so very short okay, answer. Okay, so really quickly. Typically in these, all these games you have some sort of progression. You want to go from A to B and you can buy certain steps so that you can speed up the progression so you don't need to repeat certain actions so often. But the game yeah. becomes more interesting. Yeah. Okay, so final question. Uh, now, apparently you have big plans and you're doing your IPO now, but what is the pace of the development? How big are you planning? How ambitious are you? How fast are you going to expand? Uh, well, right now, uh, the fastest we've ever done is that one week from the day we started that let's try this game idea. It was on the market with actual customers uh, for them to test and for us to measure. Uh, I don't think you can theoretically get any faster than that. So the pacing is there. We're really happy with that. Uh, what we plan to do next is to sort of uh, continue pacing that in the so-called live operations phase. So after the games have been launched, how we make sure that we're able to speed up the update schedule mm -hmm. after that, following the same methods. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Yussi. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you.